Good afternoon and welcome to the ADB private sector uh, webinar and welcome from wherever you are calling in from around the world. My name is Suzanne Gavary and I'm the Director General for Private Sector Operations at ADB. I'd first like to start with uh, some housekeeping on uh, with regards to Pigeonhole, the platform that we use for our Q&A session. Some of you may already be familiar with this, but please log on to Pigeonhole and click the Q&A icon to type your questions. ADB staff will be uh, there to help uh, curate this and select some questions uh, which we can answer at the last 30 minutes of this session. Just scan uh, the QR code or type www.pigeonhole.at. Uh, uh, the passcode is ADBMNL55. Once again, ADBMNL55. So now for the next uh, 90 minutes, we're going to be discussing how we can harness the power of the private sector and to address the challenges that have come to bear or have been illuminated by the pandemic that has grappled the world for more than two years. The pandemic may have subsided, but economies across Asia and the world are still struggling to address some of the biggest challenges from the aftermath, such as food shortages, inflation, and other economic shocks. Healthcare vulnerabilities affected the developing economies the most. Poor people struggled to get access to the care they needed. Jobs were lost and women were affected the most, primarily bearing the responsibility of dependents and in many cases, subject to abuse. As importantly, the whole world clearly realized the risk of climate change. So how do we recover, uh, boost recovery in a green and resilient manner? Most investments will need to come from, from the private sector. Most of the innovative solutions on climate financing and climate change will also need to come from the private sector as well as financing solutions. One of the things I want to address here today is how do we become more resilient and improve healthcare, address gender and wealth inequality and build resilience to climate change. We have with us today six very talented panelists who will join me in the discussion. They are our valued clients, each with them a compelling uh, development impact that makes us proud to partner with them. So without further ado, let's go to our panelists and I will let each of them introduce themselves for one minute, starting with uh, Peck Kamkanist, then followed by uh, Christian Balentra, then Ode Gyo, Lloyd Park, Sucharita Mukherjee, and Heidi Toribio. Uh, over to you, Ken Peck. Hi, thank you, Susan. Uh, my name is Peck Kampkanist. I'm the, the founder and the CEO of Impact Electronics Yam. Um, we've been partnering with ADB since um, the beginning. I think in 2008, we together with ADB has done the first solar project in Thailand under non-recourse project financing. And we continue our journey together um, throughout um, the, the development of, of renewable energy uh, against uh, climate change. Um, we have done um, the distributed and digital energy in Thailand with, with the consultation with ADBs. And then today we have, we have, um, we have joined force to, I think, to, to uh, develop and finance the largest uh, ASEAN wind farm in Laos, 600 megawatt, which um, we'll, be, we'll be chatting in, in, in the next uh, agenda. So very honored to, to be here and very excited to be part of the, the discussion on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I can, can call on Christian now, please. Hi, I'm Krishan Balendra, chairman of uh, the John Keels Group in Sri Lanka. Uh, John Keels is a conglomerate in Sri Lanka, in many ways a typical Asian conglomerate into many growth sectors of the economy. Uh, we have a container terminal at the Colombo port where we partner with AP Moller Merce. We have a old consumer brand which has been in business in Sri Lanka for over a hundred years called Elephant House, which has uh, soft drinks and ice cream under that brand. 
We operate the second largest uh, supermarket chain in the country under the Kiehl's brand. We are the largest owners and operators of uh, hotels in Sri Lanka under the Cinnamon brand. And we also have four uh, resorts in the Maldives. Uh, we also operate, own and operate an insurance company and we are the promoter shareholders of a commercial bank. We are listed on the Colombo Stock Exchange and we are uh, quite unique in that we don't have a controlling shareholder. Um, we have almost 100% free float and the business is professionally managed. The main board of directors comprise of a majority of independent directors. We are also unique in the Sri Lankan context in that we have publicly given a target uh, for a to increase the females in our workforce to 40% of our workforce. Um, so that's a quick snapshot on the John Keels Group. Thank you, Krishan. Uh, Ode. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. So I'm Ode Guo. I'm a co-founder of Innova Fida. Uh, we are a biotechnology company um, which produce uh, insect-based nutrients uh, for animal and plant nutrition uh, and which combine a very high quality uh, and uh, especially low carbon footprint. So uh, uh, we've been uh, created uh, and developing since 2016 and we develop large-scale insect rearing and processing technology that basically recycle um, agro-industrial byproducts and waste streams as feedstock for insect, uh, which then extract, combine, and concentrate different amino acids and fatty acids, which are very good for fish, poultry, pork, and can very effectively uh, replace uh, fish meal. So um, we're currently um, uh, operating in Europe, in France, uh, where we build the a world's largest insect uh, rearing and processing plant. Uh, but we've been working uh, for a long time now with uh, um, uh, Asian funds uh, and ADB to uh, also develop a project uh, in, uh, uh, in Southeast Asia. Thanks, so uh, if I can call on Lloyd. Hi, uh, this is Lloyd Park from SK Bioscience in Korea. SK Bioscience is uh, developing and manufacturing vaccine company like uh, uh, influenza vaccines in winter terms. And during pandemic, SK Bioscience uh, is leading the development of Corona vaccine project to success, as well as supplying vaccines to South Korea, many LMICs and Europe as a CMO partner for AstraZeneca and CDMO for Novavax. With a total around 120 million doses from AstraZeneca vaccines and uh, 260 million doses from Novavax vaccines, but we, but this is kind of things uh, uh, cannot be done by all, alone. Uh, we think the global collaboration is very important, so we would like to contribute to our global health securities. Thank you. Thanks, Lloyd. Sucharita, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be uh, part of uh, this panel. Uh, I'm Sucharita Mukherjee, uh, co-founder and CEO of Kaleidofin. Uh, at Kaleidofin, our dream is to make good finance available uh, through a digital fintech platform. We are specially targeted at the informal sector customer. We design products. Uh, with a gender focus, 98% of our customers are women. Uh, we have products ranging from uh, savings, credit, uh, ML-based credit health score, as well as uh, inclusive digital payment solution. Uh, we are based out of Chennai in India and have presence in 450 urban and rural districts of uh, the country. Uh, right now. Overall, uh, we have impacted about 1.4 million uh, transacting customers and, uh, uh, you know, enabled about $1 billion of uh, credit and $100 million of savings. Thanks, Sucharita. And Heidi, please. Good afternoon. My name is Heidi Turibio. I'm the regional 
co-head of client coverage for Asia at Standard Chartered Bank. And Standard Chartered Bank, we're very proud of our footprint, which reaches across over 50 emerging market uh, uh, countries uh, where we are focused on lifting the economies in which we operate. Our vision is to be the world's most sustainable and responsible bank. And we're committed to sustainable social and economic development to our businesses, our operations, and our communities. And importantly, we do this through uh, the uh, across the markets with many of the partners that are present here today, including ABB. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone, and thank you, Heidi. So what a fantastic lineup. So I'm really thrilled to have you all here today. So without further ado, let me jump into our first question, which focuses on the current macroeconomic context, which uh, I'd like to uh, address to both Heidi and Krishan. So uh, Heidi, um, I, I'm not letting you go right away. So with that, uh, as a top executive from uh, Standard Chartered, could you share a global and regional perspective on this? How is your business and your industry uh, doing in the current macroeconomic context? And are you concerned uh, about the delay in realizing business objectives and developmental objectives in Asia and the Pacific? Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you again for inviting me to be part of today's discussion. I'm, I'm very excited to be uh, hearing what we're all going to be talking about in terms of bringing this important topic forward. So you're, you're absolutely right. The past couple of years have been very disruptive, uh, not only for banks, but also for clients and the markets. Uh, the need for financing uh, growth uh, and including a just transition is immense. Um, and in this particular moment, what I think is really critical is the need for the financial community to and governments to work together uh, to explore more ways to find opportunities to blend capital uh, from additional sources uh, and to optimize this financing across the emerging market. And the need to do this now is meaningfully uh, uh, important, but also has been accelerated uh, as the uh, headwinds that are hitting us now across the global economy. Um, and I think here we're starting to experience some of the direct impacts across Asia. Sovereigns have had unprecedented stress on their balance sheets. Um, the first was the pandemic, and now we're looking at inflationary pressures. And corporate clients are adapting, but I would say certainly uh, we need to carefully monitor their ability to pass through inflationary costs that they're going to be experiencing uh, in, under these market conditions. The current macro, um, while the recessions in the West will certainly have pressure on the exports from ASEAN, uh, China's recovery may help mitigate this. However, with the exception of Singapore, what we are seeing is that we expect that the ASEAN six economies will see faster growth uh, this year uh, than last. Uh, our economists do expect that the GDP growth will accelerate to 5.3% from 3.5%, uh, which was in 2021, with still good momentum in 2023. But each region uh, is not going to be insulated from what's going on in the U.S. and uh, in the European economies. The, also, we will see monetary po uh, policy tightening uh, in the region, which can also dampen growth in 2023. ASEAN in particular is playing catch up in terms of its economic growth over the last couple of years. The region was hit very hard, as we all know, by the Delta wave last year, uh, and thankfully is moving more towards an endemic uh, stage, which should support more growth uh, as borders are opening up and tourism is increasing. We also expect that the ASEAN 6 were currently spending between 0.2 to 2% of their GDP uh, on additional subsidies this year, which could actually increase uh, depending on whether or not food and energy prices continue to climb. From a commercial perspective, uh, while interest rates have certainly helped banks uh, in terms of their flow businesses, from a balance sheet perspective, and while the tailwinds are existing and helping us, the cost of credit is really something that we need to be carefully monitoring. And what is critical at this point in time is the need to innovate, deepen funding, and broaden access to capital for our clients together. 
I think it's just important, if I may, just to spend a few moments also on sustainable finance and some of the uh, uh, facts that we would like to be able to share. Asia represents 20% or $1 trillion of the cumulative $5 trillion global sustainable finance market, which is significantly lower than its proportion of global GDP, which is roughly around 45%. And according to a report that we did, which is called Just in Time, emerging markets will need an additional $94.8 trillion to transition to net zero in time to meet the long-term global warming target. This is on top of the current capital that's already been committed by a number of these countries uh, in terms of their current climate policies. So this presents an incredibly enormous opportunity as well as a challenge. And while it's clear uh, we need to accelerate just transition, um, and not only uh, in energy, but also in developing uh, development financing. And this is where partnering with uh, multilateral banks, such as ADB, is critical to helping to make sure that a transition uh, has a successful journey. So as I highlighted in my opening remarks, closing the funding gap requires a degree of policy continuity, robust legal frameworks, and a commercially viable transactions. So we are very much excited to play a part in partnering together with all of you, uh, but also in, in terms of finding more ways to close that gap and support the growth that's already ahead of us. Thank you. Thanks very much, Heidi. And you've, you've put out some pretty big issues out there, obviously lots of challenges. Um, with regards to the, and, and opportunities with the need to be able to collaborate uh, and to innovate uh, to actually address these these uh, gaps of what I would call in the market. And, uh, you know, so these are some of the issues that I think that, you know, we really warrant further discussion. Um, so, Christian, I'll, I'll turn to you. So how is your business coping with the current context in Sri Lanka? Are you concerned? Most structural solutions are in the hands of the government, but what can the private sector do to support recovery? Uh, thanks, uh, Suzanne. I think, uh, as all of you know, Sri Lanka has been uh, badly impacted, I think not entirely because of the global macroeconomic conditions, but also uh, some, some issues that were quite uh, local to Sri Lanka. So we've been through the worst uh, economic crisis that we've seen uh, in recent times in the last six months. Uh, we've had a very steep devaluation of the currency, high inflation, high interest rates. Um, you know, we, we have the 10-year Sri Lanka government rupee bond at 30% uh, interest rates of 30%. But what, what has been most challenging for business has been that at the peak of the issues around from April to June this year, we had uh, severe shortages. Because of the forex crisis, there was a shortage of um, diesel and petrol and long power cuts of uh, on some days of over 10 hours a day and also uh, shortages of domestic gas. Uh, which is an important part for most households for, for cooking. Um, fortunately, that situation has improved in the last, last two months, but coping with that was a challenge for business over those three months. And uh, we saw the resilience of the private sector. Uh, the government uh, enabled the private sector to import uh, their own fuel uh, for their business purposes. Uh, so with the long power cuts, the issue was having the diesel for generators and also diesel for trucks and other forms of transport. And we were able to procure that as uh, some private sector companies that were doing bunkering for ships were licensed to also sell diesel in the local market as long as the customers were able to pay, pay in, in dollars. So... Uh, so that that helped to overcome that sort of crisis at that point. Uh, but the situation continues to be quite challenging. Interest rates, as I said, are close to 
close to 30 percent and inflation is 60 70 percent the impact though on our businesses um, if i look at the last six months surprisingly uh, has not been so significant the consumer businesses I, as i mentioned earlier we have a the number one brand uh, for soft drinks and ice cream uh, and the volumes in those businesses continue to be very strong despite the high cost of living and these are uh, discretionary items uh, you would have thought volumes have fallen off but volumes continue to be strong um, so you know I don't want to attribute it to one or two reasons but uh, it, it has it has surprised us and if you look at our portfolio of businesses the foreign currency uh, businesses have can, have done very well uh, benefiting from the devaluation like like the container port the uh, bunkering businesses and some of the other other businesses in the group the only impact really has been on the on the uh, sri lankan hotel business because of all the bad publicity around uh, the shortages and the queues um, and the power cuts, we have seen tourist arrivals falling quite sharply to Sri Lanka, and the hotel business has has been impacted as a result. The other challenge and something that we have been very proactive about in this uh, high cost of living uh, scenario, which has been a shock to the community, is to care for our staff and to care for our community. So we have, for our staff, looked at special allowances, Discounts for our own products and this, you know, special offers in our in our supermarkets, and also arranging counselling for staff where where it was required, um, and also caring caring for the community. But overall, the private sector, I think, has stepped up. They have improvised uh, in very challenging times. As I said, the worst economic crisis the country has faced in many, many decades. But we have seen the private sector improvising and being resilient, not just John Keels, but across uh, the private sector as a whole in Sri Lanka. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Krishan. I think it's once again one of those points that you've made about uh, opportunities and innovation uh, coming from uh, uh, the private sector in times of hardship and stress like this. So um, thank you very much, Krishan and Heidi, for your perspectives uh, on the current macroeconomic context. And so now I'd like to turn to Lloyd and Sucharita to explore future resilience uh, so that future crises will not uh, catch us quite as unprepared. So for Lloyd, if I can turn to you first, um, the healthcare industry has been at the forefront of the response during the pandemic. You've mentioned a little bit about this already, but what can your company and your industry do to help reinforce the resilience of populations in Asia and the Pacific to future health and economic shocks? How can we do better next time? Yeah, that's very critical questions for preparing next pandemic, for example. Uh, we have, no doubt, we have experienced and observed a huge impact in terms of not only uh, national health security, but also economics. Uh, and the, still, the key issues is developing and uh, supplying uh, vaccines. Although the condition is better than before, I think we need to prepare endemic and also next pandemic. For the preparedness for endemic, still we should be cautious about a variant of coronavirus. And if we required, we are ready for quick development of vaccine for the variants. For further steps, uh, our company is developing so-called pan virus vaccines, which can handle, handle wide range of various corona vaccines. But we have learned that no one can handle this kind of readiness for oneself. For the preparations, we will pursue an even more active and closer partnership based on the partnership experience of, of the, over the current pandemic. SK Bioscience will strengthen its collaboration further with global initiatives like Bill Gates Foundation and SEPI or Gavi 
as well as play a role in establishing and strengthening the ecosystems by working with global and domestic research institutions, hospitals, bioventures, and multinational corporations. Trust necessary innovation in platform technology and process innovations. I would like to introduce one uh, project called S uh, SkyShield. SkyShield involves the establishment of vaccine facilities in countries that need them through public-private partnerships. The, the establishment of joint ventures uh, definitely could be a specific model for the project. We would like to transfer its R&D and manufacturing technology to the local JB. The JB will produce vaccines with local demand in peacetime and quickly transition to pandemic vaccines in the event of a pandemic. The flexibility of manufacturing structures and the facility for quick transitions will be critical as we need the four necessary conditions to be met for strengthening global collaborations, which are first one is goodwill to contribute to global public health, and second, specific targets like products based on technological and the process innovations. And three, differentiated strengths to contribute to the ecosystem. And the last one is capacity for global collaboration based on transparency and the trustworthiness. In doing so, we'll actively participate in global collaboration for next pandemic readiness. If you can observe the current time gap between developed country and uh, in Asia in terms of variant vaccines, those kind of readiness is very crucial for uh, next pandemic also closer time for the endemic. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lloyd, and, and uh, you know, for your insights. And what's interesting is that from the last couple of uh, speakers already, we're hearing uh, commonalities about innovation, partnership, collaboration, uh, which are some of the solutions or some of the ways of looking forward. So, so um, if I can actually uh, turn to Sucharita, uh, the poor are always disproportionately affected, whatever the nature of the crisis, health, climate-related, or economic. Um, what solutions do you think uh, microfinance can bring to resilience at the bottom of the pyramid? Yeah, no, thanks so much, Suzanne. Um, uh, overall, uh, one of Kaleidofin's key priorities is financial health. Uh, one of the key reasons for that is that uh, informal sector customers, women in particular, experience very high volatility of both income and expenses. According to uh, research on in informal sector customers in South Asia, this is 40% uh, on the income side, 40 to 50% on the expense side, which means that surpluses are varying as much as 100%. Uh, finance can do a lot uh, to really build that resilience and reduce this volatility that they experience um, in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, I'll talk through one of the financial solutions that we have uh, structured. It's called KaiCash. Uh, KaiCash is basically a digital goal-linked saving solutions. Uh, we ask customers uh, to think about their real life goals. A lot of our customers choose, for example, uh, education of uh, their children um, or uh, building a bathroom in their house, renovating their house. These are very common uh, real life goals that our customers want to achieve in very definite time frames. And uh, in some sense, um, you know, not having the tools to do so uh, really prevents them from actually making progress with their life. So what Kaikash is, is that we move away from the construct of um, products from a manufacturer's perspective, but instead look at solutions from a customer's perspective. So we combined regular savings, uh, insurance against key risks, like life, accident, and disability, and an emergency credit line altogether, uh, along with a good, fair bank account and a Kaikash debit card, uh, 
uh, to say that this is how you can really very reliably uh, get to your goals. Uh, what customers have to do is simply choose um, a tenor of the goal uh, as well as uh, choose the type of the goal. We do a real-time financial health assessment of the customer that enables us to choose the right type of savings instrument for them and uh, they're ready to go. We also have uh, a digital um, a payment mandate tool, which allows us to work with customers uh, who have bank accounts in not just the large ICICI banks, city banks of the world, but also Grameen banks, cooperative banks, uh, which find it much, much more challenging to set up digital payment mandates. We actually devised a solution that works for feature phone customers, as well as uh, for customers with uh, Grameen and cooperative bank accounts. So they could actually set up digital payment mandates. And in fact, we were one of the few uh, platforms that was able uh, to help customers save even during the pandemic, even during uh, the lockdown. Uh, overall, uh, because of these efforts, um, almost uh, 500 million rupees um, uh, has been insured against life, accident, and disability each, um, and um, 70 billion rupees uh, of credit has been enabled through these platforms. Now, uh, I think what we have right now is really the tip of the iceberg. Life, accident, and disability are the big time risks that can completely wipe you out. There is much, much more product development to be done uh, by Kaleidofin as well as the industry, for example, in maternity insurance, uh, in shopkeepers insurance, which can really both protect livelihoods as well as uh, protect women and help them come back uh, to the workforce um, uh, when they're ready to. Uh, and we're looking forward to developing both uh, credit savings, as well as insurance solutions in partnership with uh, institutions like yourselves. Uh, significant support is definitely required because, um, you know, for example, digital marketing strategies uh, for this customer segment, women in the informal sector, is virtually unknown, unresearched. Uh, this needs an uh, incredible amount of work, but excited to be on that path. Thanks very much, Sarita. Uh, I mean, it's very interesting, you know, once again, you know, talking about how innovation uh, can uh, provide client-oriented solutions. I really like that. And using digital solutions to reach those, those clients. Um, I think that's, uh, you know... A, you know, I really want to thank you and, and Lloyd for your contribution to making the region more resilient. So now I'd like to turn to Kuhn Beck and Ode to address the bigger topic of climate change. The private sector, of course, is the main emitter of private uh, greenhouse gas across energy, transport, industries, and agriculture. And the private sector at the same time must step in and bring solutions. So uh, Kuhn Beck, energy production in Asia is still dominated by fossil fuels. How can we transition towards a greater proportion of renewable energy? And what is your company doing? Uh, what is your commitment to strategy towards net zero? What else could be done by your industry to accelerate decarbonization? Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, it is a great question. Um, we, we, our company has been committed and contribute to uh, our quest against climate change since the establishment. Um, I see two, two things that we can do. One is restructuring the regulations, uh, contracts, and the other is to modernize technology, combining uh, uh, complementary technology to, to allow uh, more renewables and decarbonization. For, for us, I think um, we, have, um, we have done uh, a private corporate PPA in 2016, where there's no regulation in place. We have offer a customer with, with the customer focus on the saving of the energy. We have offer the customer between 5% discount to 50%, over 50% discount to the government tariff. And today we have achieved 
over 145 megawatt of uh, solar system portfolio. We have over 100 uh, location of solar systems, and we have over 45 brand. Sorry, uh, we have our system over 45 provinces of Thailand. Recently, we have decarbonized a 40 years old uh, industrial park where we provide solar system, floating solar, a battery, uh, EV charging to decarbonize the, the carbon footprint. And the other project that we are working on closely with ADB is, is the Monsoon 600 megawatt project, which is a cross-border um, providing wind energy from Laos to Vietnam. We again has to draft a new PPA uh, starting from a white paper where we have a focus on um, a bankable PPA. Uh, we have achieved a US dollar payment in English law, Singapore arbitration, um, you know, termination payment, as well as change in law protection. If, if this project is implemented, which we are about to close this um, project financing with ADB as our lead arranger. Uh, we have we're going to be able to raise uh, about seven hundred million US dollars. I think ADB as a lead, lead arranger has achieved over three times subscribe for project financing, and we'll be able to save over twenty million ton of, of, of carbons. Beyond that, I think we are commit. 1 million US dollar each year over 25 years project life to uplifting the well-being of the community we operated in. Uh, we're focusing on uh, improving health, healthcare, uh, sanitation, and of course, income. And you know, being part of the community and, and uplifting the well-being is part of our passion. The other thing that we, we, we want to see more is, is uh, uh, you know, a transition from fossil fuel to, to renewable. And one of the ideas that we have is, you know, let the renewable be a priority of dispatch and then using the fossil fuel as intermediates and peaking to balancing uh, uh, the load of, of, of uh, the demand and, and supply. We also think combining renewable technology may, may be achieve a dispatchable renewable energy such we find in Laos that combining Hydropower and wind is yield a perfect complementary where the hydro will generate mostly on the wet season and the wind is generated during a dry season. So that's that's where we're looking at and we, 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 we are full speed ahead to try to achieve those in, in the near future. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Kunbeck. You know, I know that uh, we've been working very intensely together to, to make this happen. But, you know, again, being very client focused, customer focused to try and come up with innovative and new solutions for what is, you know, a hugely important objective and, and need. Um, so I'll turn over to Ode now. So Ode food production accounts to uh, for about a third of global emissions and puts pressure on that biodiversity. So what can we do better to reduce emissions and minimize impact? Yeah, um, thank you, Suzanne. Um, so from our perspective, um, indeed we started InnovaFit six years ago with uh, really the mission of developing alternative protein and nutrient sources um, that would combine high quality, uh, but would really focus on uh, lower our carbon emissions. Um, so uh, sustainability is really at the heart and the beginning of our, our, our project. Um, and when we started out, we were struck by exactly what you just said, which is the food industry is uh, responsible of 30% of our emissions. And we needed to reduce that by 70% um, if we wanted to reach, uh, the, 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 you know, to go uh, below 2% uh, increase in temperature. And this seemed a real challenge considering that this means we need to feed more people uh, with better nutrients, uh, but with much less resources. So um, decarbonization of the food industry is really critical. And what we thought uh, we could do was to really um, not uh, being content with the uh, existing, but develop uh, other protein sources uh, that would be sustainable uh, and also a different production model and different technologies um, that would you know, help us to produce this at large scale 
um, and make the sources accessible in terms of you know just cost so that it can have a real impact. Um, today our products uh, are 50 to 80 percent lower in carbon footprint compared to an uh, existing ingredient uh, with higher nutritional value um, and uh, at a competitive price. Um, and this is the reason why our clients are, are interested. Um, the way this commitment affects uh, the way we build the company is uh, actually everywhere. Um, this is why we chose to uh, address animal nutrition uh, instead of human nutrition uh, at the beginning, uh, because we thought it would have a, a, a faster uh, volumic uh, impact while you know, introducing new sources to human nutrition would require more time uh, and, ed and consumer education. Um, this is also why we chose to work on, on insects, uh, which has a, a high nutritional value and require minimum resource to grow. And we worked a lot on the biology of insect and on its genetics to improve uh, bioconversion potential. Um, we also heavily invested in process and technology um, that minimize use of natural resources. Uh, and today to rear insects, we essentially use byproduct and waste streams from agro-industry um, and also uh, waste energy streams for our process. Um, so we basically built our plant next to grain processing plants, for, uh, for instance, and to access those waste, waste streams that cannot be moved and which are, are most of the time also an environmental concern. So by design, uh, we, we, we build a link in the food industry that enabled decarbonization. Um, now, I think what our role uh, is and what I think, you know, new companies as uh, ours, uh, innovation companies, um, role is really finding those alternative uh, protein sources, which are critical to give our society a choice for a more sustainable and better food system. But the other thing I think we need to do um, is also to make that choice uh, by giving information to the consumers. Um, what we see is that, you know, today consumers care, they really care about uh, eating better food, choosing healthier food, and, and, and also um, they want to take an active part in shifting the way we choose what we eat in a sustainable manner. Um, they are taking those steps when they, they know, uh, when they have the information of a carbon footprint, but few of them are, are aware of their impact when buying food. Um, so today we've seen um, scoring systems that have developed on a scoring nutritional values uh, in some countries. Um, I think if we're able to also develop scoring systems that indicate the carbon footprint of the different uh, food product uh, consumer purchase, this would probably drive the shift much faster than what we're seeing. No, thanks for that, uh, Ode. I, I think I like the idea of empowering consumers with it to help them make uh, proper decisions and try drive change. Um, so uh, thank you, Ode and, and uh, Kun Peck, for your, your uh, fascinating work that you're, uh, that you're doing to bring new technologies and new ways of working uh, to make our world sustainable. So now I'm going to turn to you a little bit more to the promoting uh, inclusiveness with technology. And how can we use that to improve social inclusion? So I'd like to turn to uh, Sucharita and, and Lloyd. Um, so uh, first, uh, Sucharita, if I can uh, turn to you uh, with regards to what is the role of technology in promoting social inclusion, including offering more opportunities to women and disadvantaged groups in the countries in which you operate. And, and I believe you have uh, some great examples of, of, of this financial inclusion. You've given us uh, some already, um, but uh, great to hear what your thoughts are. Well, thanks so much, Suzanne. I think, um, uh, you know, technology and finance together have such a transformational role uh, to play in inclusion. Uh, you know, just wanted to set some context here uh, with uh, some data from the uh, Global Findex report. Um, uh, we found uh, from the Findex report that the levels of dormancy in, um, uh, you know, women-owned bank accounts is 50% higher. Uh, than for men. And now, you know, let's think about what could be the reasons that are driving this. One of the reasons is clearly remoteness. 
um, lack of mobility, lack of assistance. Uh, what we have done um, is created all our tech architecture in two ways. Uh, one is direct which you and I consume finance. Uh, the second is uh, sort of an agent-led assisted app architecture where uh, you uh, really think about uh, security, fraud checks, KYC in an entirely assisted uh, interface. Now, the thing is that um, uh, finance is quite um, unique in a way uh, because, um, you know, when uh, our customers are experiencing finance, finance as such, because of regulation, has so many hurdles. It's so much more difficult to do digital financial transactions than watch a YouTube video or, um, uh, you know, send a WhatsApp. Um, uh, you don't need uh, KYC to order food, uh, right? <laughs> Uh, but you need KYC to do the simplest uh, financial transaction. You need to set up payments. You need to remember pins. It is actually quite hard. Uh, so uh, therefore, developing an assisted app architecture has been really critical in helping us um, not compromise on security issues, but yet make sure that we have 3,000 plus agents across the country, across India, approaching our customers, a lot of them women, and helping them to gain entry into the world of digital finance uh, with that assistance that so, um, as, you know, uh, very much need uh, to go into the next level. Uh, you know, I just wanted to put another data point. Um, uh, during COVID, we had a lot of uh, sort of digitization happening across the world, including in India. But again, here, the gender gap is almost 300%. 15% uh, of men have digital money accounts, whereas only 5% of women do. Now, again, uh, you know, uh, here there is an opportunity because on the other hand, we see that women's usage of informal financial services like chit funds and rotating savings schemes actually has a positive gender gap. And we see that the only difference between the two is the accessibility and um, uh, the assistance and uh, the respect uh, and the use of local language uh, here, which is even more important. Uh, so here, uh, you know, we do believe that using voice, uh, using local language, both in app as well as um, uh, through call centers has been critical in getting our customers to actually save and engage with financial services. Thanks very much for that. Uh, you threw out some pretty big numbers and 300% difference is, is a huge number. And, and obviously local solutions and, and uh, informing and educating are, are all part of the solution. So thank you for that. Um, Lloyd, I'd like to turn to you. Um, healthcare technologies like uh, vaccines and advanced treatment drugs and devices can be extremely expensive. Uh, can technology also be targeted at the poor? Can private sector companies help transfer technology from richer to poorer countries? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sujan. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Maybe we all can remember the first phase of uh, this pandemic area. Uh, uh, the, one of the key issues is inequality for supplying uh, uh, supplying um, vaccines over the world. Still, we have that kind of issues. <clears throat> and uh, mm, and uh, while there are numerous implications for next pandemic responses, the most important one would be speed. Because the in price terms, there are many global initiatives is working on that. So we can provide the lower price of vaccines. CEPI recently announced it's going to roll out vaccines in 100 days. 
and the Gates Foundation aims to have a vaccine for all in six months. Then the message to us is very clear, because usually the vaccine development stages takes 10 year timeline, and through this pandemic, it shortened to one year. But we need to shorten it more than to 100 days, and this is an extremely difficult goal with existing methods and technologies. We need to apply innovative technologies all over the world. Such discussions are already underway in further detail in global initiatives, in preparations for implementations. Vaccine development in 100 days and global supply in six months means that every step of the process will undergo innovations. We can consider innovation platforms uh, tech uh, from the point of view of drug substance <coughs> and the drug product and the manufacturing, which can quicker and lower price of supply month. For, uh, for drug substances, our experience this pandemic was an opportunity to reaffirm the uh, importance of immunogen design and adjuvants. And there are many, many biotechs is working on we should uh, invest in those kind of companies for next innovations. Also, it is difficult to exaggerate the importance of mRNA. Everyone knows now in the mRNA vaccines, which is necessary not only for speed, but also the propagation of the other fields. Also, uh, over the world, uh, and even in Asia, there are many, many biotechs uh, working on this, and we will seek such platforms through global research collaborations. Uh, and the expedient global supply also requires re-innovations in manufacturing technologies because many, many countries has no that kind of high level manufacturing technologies, so they have no choice but to very expensive vaccines. Uh, we will upgrade our existing facilities and the technology to establish so-called micro-facility system in these micro facilities, both cell culture productions of vital materials and also purification could occur within a small environment. This would cause a drastic reduction in required manufacturing footprint, and the entire system could be quickly installed in countries where there might not be the existing manufacturing structures that exist in the developed world. Such technological innovations are also impossible alone and will require synergies through global collaboration like many uh, biotechs. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Lloyd and, and Sarita, uh, Sarita, uh, Sarita, sorry, excuse me, for these great examples of uh, concrete work to make uh, technology an instrument of social inclusion. I, I think that, you know, we've some of the innovation and, and the ideas that we've been seeing has been very inspirational. And now the world is again facing another immediate crisis, which many thought would not come again of this magnitude. High food prices and food insecurity Two of our panelists, uh, Krishan and Ode, are involved in, in food production, and I want to hear their views on what the private sector's role is in ensuring food security in Asia and the Pacific. So, Krishan, if I could turn to you first, um, your group is, as you mentioned, involved in both food production and distribution, and we have helped you in, in financing some of your su supermarkets and, and the logistics uh, centers. How are you coping uh, with inflation, ensuring that food remains available? Yes, it's been a challenging environment. Inflation is one issue, but uh, you know, you, you could, I think each country have their own issues to deal with, and there wouldn't be one uh, solution we can talk across all countries in Asia or or worldwide. <clears throat> so I thought I'll speak a little about some of the uh, issues we've been facing in Sri Lanka. Uh, the first and the biggest issue on <clears throat> food security is that about a year back, the authorities brought in a complete ban on chemical fertilizer use in agriculture and <coughs> overnight switch to organic fertilizer, which of course was not available in the quantities required and it was not practical to do it, but but in fact, 
the ban on chemical fertilizers was brought in overnight. So we had to respond to that. And as uh, the, one of the biggest supermarket chains, we source uh, directly from farmers through collection centers. And we have uh, thousands of farmers across the country. And um, the one way that we address that is by educating uh, the farmers on optimum use of fertilizer. Small quantities were available. We were able to obtain small quantities. And all these years in Sri Lanka, fertilizer had been subsidized quite heavily. So it was, in a sense, our farm, uh, farmers had got used to overusing fertilizer. Um, so we had to react to that situation. We were able to help the farmers obtain um, a, a smaller quantity of fertilizer, and we were able to educate them on uh, coping with smaller quantities. Uh, as a result of so what we have done and what the rest of the private sector has done and the innovation of the farmers themselves, overall agricultural production has fallen by only about 30%, but not as much as you would have thought, given that there is a complete ban on, on fertilizer. Uh, the other issue was diesel availability uh, that I spoke about earlier. And there as well, as a private sector, I, I said we were able to improvise and innovate and source the diesel. And we used some of that diesel, apart from using it for our own generators and trucks, we were able to provide diesel to some of our distributors to ensure that their trucks operated and we could get uh, the agricultural produce and other food items uh, to our to our shelves and to and to customers the other way that we dealt with the situation was because of the high inflation uh, we worked on educating <coughs> our customers especially through our supermarkets educating our customers on substitute products that would provide similar nutrition but was available and cheaper, cheaper in price. Uh, also with the uh, cost escalation, we looked at sourcing from other countries that we would typically not source from. So we worked on multiple new uh, source markets to source uh, food uh, at the best possible prices, markets that we had not worked on before. We also, uh, encouraged communities in the vicinity of our businesses, like in the vicinity of our hotels, our factories outside the main cities, to look at home gardening. And we provided seeds and training on good agricultural practices. And we are actually quite heartened to see good progress in home gardening <coughs> in the neighborhoods around where we operate. Um, the other uh, solution was CSR, was to really look at what we can do for low-income groups. And one big initiative that we have undertaken is, again, in areas that we operate, is to provide school meals for school children in certain schools and also provide um, food bags, essential food bags to communities in areas that we operate. <clears throat> and also a priority for us, of course, have been our staff and their families. And we have done as much as possible to provide meals and provide uh, essential food uh, allowances and so on to, to our staff. So I thought I'll just speak about some of the specific issues that we have faced in Sri Lanka, which I think would be similar to some other countries as well. No, thanks very much, Krishan. I mean, obviously, education and and training is and coming up with solutions is very much part of you know the, all the things that are necessary and what you need. Um, so, Ode, if I can turn to you now, um, some of the things that you mentioned, uh, new types of food are meant to be great for the planet, but are they affordable and can they be a response to food security? Yes, um, I think affordability and access to all is a is a real question. Um, and what we see uh, for us um, as a technology player 
is to really offer uh, solutions and access uh, to uh, better nutrients, which can be produced at large scale, so, uh, so as to guarantee accessibility, um, and locally, um, so in, uh, for instance, in Asia. Um, as I mentioned before, so one of the key components of our technology today is using uh, byproducts and, and waste streams um, and converting them into high value uh, proteins. We've been currently operating in Europe, uh, which has a lot of wheat. So it's mostly a wheat based uh, waste streams that we're using. But we have been uh, through the past years uh, investing a lot in um, developing also uh, technology that can process pound based uh, byproduct and, and, and waste streams. Uh, so that we can produce insect nutrients and uh, protein source out of the palm industry uh, waste. And that can be significant uh, in Asia, uh, where there are now uh, about 10 to 20 million uh, tons of uh, palm byproduct and waste, um, which are not only low value, but has a real environmental impact and is a concern because their disposal is really challenging. And if today we're able to apply uh, insect bioconversion technology to these streams in Asia, this would mean creating uh, industry uh, in Asia that would produce three to four million tons of insect protein, or in other words, that represents something like half the size, 50% of the current fish meal industry, um, fish meal that uh, we import mostly from uh, Latin uh, uh, America and to which uh, insect meal is a good comparable to. And Christian just mentioned also um, the uh, uh, lack of organic fertilizer uh, in, uh, in Sri Lanka. Um, the, uh, in, in our industry, so uh, fertilizer is actually a byproduct. And so again, applying uh, our technology to the palm waste, uh, we can produce up to 10 to 15, 15 million tons of uh, organic fertilizer in Asia. Um, so uh, this would uh, significantly contribute to ensuring food uh, security uh, locally, uh, while also solving an environmental issue, which is the disposal of uh, uh, palm uh, palm waste. Um, so I think on on, on that um, on, on those those kind of topics, the role of technology players as us is really to provide new solutions, um, things that do not exist and to offer uh, this choice at large scale to, uh, to, to, to the different uh, populations. No, thank you very much for that, uh, Ode and, and Krishan, for your insights on, on food security and, and uh, some of the solutions that you've actually provided, uh, which is on the minds of many business and, and political leaders right now. So um, now, you know, as part of uh, looking forward to how ADB can help the private sector accelerate the deployment uh, of these solutions to economic recovery, resilience, net zero transition, social inclusion, <clears throat> and food security. So for this, I'm going to turn to uh, Kun Peck and Heidi for this final question um, before we take some questions from, from the audience. Um, so trillions of dollars of investments are required to build a green and resilient Asia and Pacific region and support the net zero transition. Most funds uh, will need to come from the private sector, given the, the stretched uh, uh, um, uh, government balance sheets and, and fiscal constraints. And what role can ADB play in mobilizing more private sector funds towards the right investments and the le in the less developed countries in the region? So Kun Peck, if I can turn to you, you know, um, you know, ADB has committed 100 billion in climate finance uh, from 2019 to 2030, and we've worked together, obviously, from some of the examples uh, that you've you've uh, shared with regards to this shared ambition. What insightful examples can you share about some of these, you know, ways that we can work together uh, going forward? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think. This has been a, a dream of mine for a long time since um, we started the Monsoon project. And um, we found that the wind and, and the hydro are very complementary um, through our 12 years measurement of, of uh, wind data. And I think combining the wind and the hydro allow us to fully utilize the transmission line. One of, one of the ideas that we combining um, the wind 
a thousand megawatt wind on the monsoon expansion and the surrounding hydro project, which doesn't have a host at the moment. So we can combine the two, you know, 1,000 of wind and 1,000 hydro can deliver as far as Singapore. So we are participating in the Singapore solicitation, uh, solicitation for, for import of low carbon energy um, to package uh, a renewable energy that can achieve a 75% capacity factor, which is unheard of, you know, using the battery because of this perfect complementary of both technology. I think with that, I, I, we, 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 would, uh, we would need a transmission line. We go across countries such as Cambodia uh, through a subsea to Singapore that's around on land transmission lines about 600 kilometers and subsea is about 1400 kilometers. We believe that the, the project will be able to supply to Singapore um, with the satisfy all the requirements of the capacity factor as well as non-intermittency of every 30 minutes using the hydro as a balancing um, energy. I think that project alone can take about 10 billion out of your 100 billion um, money available for a green and resilient uh, Asia Pacific region. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, you know, I know that uh, some innovative solutions and, and regional solutions, I think, are, are um, needed. So, Heidi, if I can turn to you, um, ADB's balance sheet, like any bank, has its limits. And, and so how can we leverage more funds from commercial banks and other uh, sources of capital towards development? And maybe you can share some examples of your co collaboration with ADB across various products and areas. Thank you. I'd be very glad to do that. And, and first, I would like to highlight, I do feel that ADB plays an incredibly important role in helping to organize, but also mobilize private capital. Um, and getting the collaboration across governments, banks, uh, longer term investors uh, to help accelerate uh, the delivery of blended finance solutions is really uh, critical and quite imperative. Um, I think the second thing I would point out is being stewards in the markets that experience stress and volatility. Uh, as debt burdens of governments are increasing, it challenges the access to scalable financing platforms. And I think here, the private sector is most effective when key anchors are in place uh, before deploying capital and size. And this is where ADB uh, serving as a steward uh, in these tumultuous times uh, can really help bring risk-based solutions, whether it could be risk participation programs, they really go a long way and permit banks uh, to be remain viable uh, participants in the markets during those, during those occasions. The other point I think is important to highlight is around advisory role. I think that the work that you're doing there um, to help address some of the most challenging aspects of what will be a just transition uh, is, you know, is really quite critical. Here we're getting into frameworks uh, and what will permit uh, a scalable uh, financing solutions with robust legal frameworks are needed. You need clarity on policies. You know, we need viable commercial structures. And this takes time to be thought through um, as well as a lot of negotiations that go with that. So helping countries access blended finance, uh, I think, uh, and then I think Nepal comes to mind as an example for me, uh, where blended finance could be the answer to them unlocking uh, the transition journey that's ahead of them in terms of the hydropower potential that they, that they have available to them. When I think about our efforts uh, as a bank to accelerate next, we're committed to mobilize over $300 billion in green and transition financed by 2030. And we're very proud to have partnered with ADB on a number of transactions uh, that have helped us and, and will continue to help us deploy this capital across microfinance, financial institutions, but also corporate clients. And I'd also like to highlight some of the work that we've done in Vietnam, where we did the project financing, which is the largest uh, solar, plower, uh, solar plant. Uh, and where ADB participated in the A loan and Standard Chartered together with some of the other banks participated in the B loans. 
projects like these are precedent, and it's really important to help open doors for others to be able to participate. And lastly, I'd like to point to calls like today and the number of the conferences that, that you host that you help facilitate the partnership and connect companies uh, uh, and draw, that are driving the innovation, as we've heard today, some really fantastic examples that might require further financing and would benefit from, from, from uh, access to more capital. So we're certainly keen to do more with ADB, uh, as well as the partners on the call and others uh, that will help recognize the power uh, and the ability of us as a collective to drive and advance uh, the financing to make sure that we can reach our goals a bit faster. Thank you. Thanks very much, Heidi, uh, very much for that. Um, what we're going to do now is, is uh, you know, look at how we can turn to the audience, uh, uh, more precisely to pigeonhole, uh, to see what interesting questions have come in. A number of them have come in that I have in front of me. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll each, uh, you know, address some of them to each of you. So uh, I'm going to turn to Ode, if I can, first. And so the first question, I'll, I'll have to ask you to be a little bit shorter. You were running out of time a little bit with some of the questions. So, you know, succinct to answers, if you don't mind. Um, uh, old, while new technologies are being pursued to address the food and climate crisis, are the, there are processes in place to ensure that uh, these do not contribute more harm to the environment and livelihoods? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> I think the first uh, thing we do is we measure, we ensure that we measure. Um, in, our, in our case, uh, we build our model with a, a life cycle analysis so as to uh, really design uh, our processes and technologies um, with the carbon uh, footprint in mind. And I think what, what, what is you know, happening um, and, and um, more and more is, is not that concern is quite uh, real everywhere. And so there's also um, just a general pressure on new innovation technology companies about measuring their actual uh, emissions. So um, I think measuring uh, gives accountability and ensures that we are actually moving in the right direction and not uh, uh, and on the wrong one. Thanks very much. Measurement and accountability, something that is at the core of many of discussions that are going on right now. Um, I'll now turn to Dr. Park, if you don't mind. Next question is for you. Uh, many developing countries uh, struggle to get adequate vaccines. How can SK help in improving technology transfers to developing countries and therefore make uh, access to vaccine more equitable? Yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe I introduced the Sky, uh, Sky Shield project because uh, many uh, undeveloped countries uh, is a short of capacity of uh, facilities or the technologies. SK Bioscience is willing to share those kind of uh, technology and uh, capacity for facilities. The requirement would be the government in, uh, government willingness to introduce those kind of technology and produce uh, relevant vaccines in their country. So I, uh, we are suggesting that. Uh, uh, we are suggesting in JV firms, the local, any kinds of uh, companies can uh, introduce those kind of concept with the SK Bioscience. We'll, we'll share the, our technology and the production uh, technologies. Then uh, in peacetime, the country can produce their uh, required uh, vaccines in peacetime and in pandemic uh, seasons. Uh, if it occurs, it can trans transit to the uh, required vaccine uh, technologies uh, by collaborations with the SK Bioscience. Thanks very much for that. Um, Heidi, I was wondering if I could turn to you now, um, uh, if I can ask you, if you can share a little bit more about how Standard Charter uses blended finance to meet its climate's goals examples and what lessons from other private sector players, uh, what can we learn from this? Well, I think that uh, we're all very much on this journey to see how we can most effectively deploy the capital that's, uh, that, that we have and how we think through just, just, just transition. 
So a critical part of, of what we've been doing is partnering together with a lot of the countries in which we operate. So first we start with the countries and we think about what is the just transition plan or the transition plan that they have uh, and what are the most critical needs that they will require over a period of time. So we'll work with them in terms of the policy, the framework. Then we take a look also uh, at the clients that would be sitting in that particular market to say, what kind of uh, challenges might they be so it could be an, under a particular industry. So when you look at metals and mining, it will be very different than the healthcare um, versus the financial uh, services uh, industry. So we really take the time to sit down with each of the clients, better understand what is it that they're doing and what are the needs that they would have in order to drive a transition for themselves, but also importantly for their market. Thanks for that. Uh, can, uh, if I can now. Um, if I can ask you, how can ADB ensure robust environment and social safeguards in private sector operations? And what has been your experience with solar and wind projects, for example? Um, I think on the, on the wind project, we haven't worked with ADB since the beginning. So we have discussed this um, ENS issue, um, including the women uh, leadership inequalities, as well as the indigenous, as well as uh, biodiversity. I think you know we have been uh, preparing uh, and, and consult with advisor together with ADB to achieve this um, um, ENS report and prepare plan when we implement the project. We make sure that we mitigate and uh, support the, the you know the social and environment issues. Okay. Okay, thanks very much for that. Uh, uh, Suricha, uh, Suricha, if I could turn to you. Um, fintech has been essentially changed. It's changed the definition of, of the unbanked. Uh, how do we accelerate the use of fintech platforms to empower more people and improve wealth distribution? Good question. Uh, uh, yeah, my name is pronounced as Sucharita, uh, by the way. Uh, so um, I think, uh, you know, fintech can do a lot um, in ensuring that uh, financial services are available to meet our customers' life goals. Uh, now, uh, there are a few examples of how. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we know that our customers do not use, um, uh, you know, typing as an interface at all. They use voice, uh, much more comfortable in voice. And therefore, uh, you know, the in-app voice architecture, uh, the local language call centers, um, as well as uh, the automated intelligent uh, voice space assisted uh, formats are ways of making sure that even uh, customers who are physically remote are not actually remote. Uh, we actually even used, um, uh, you know, voice based, automated voice based outreach during COVID times to ensure that, uh, you know, the nearest emergency care was well known and available. And this was very, very successful. Uh, with multiple use cases. So we find uh, something like 80% plus listen rates to voice. Uh, and I think uh, a voice and local language uh, combination can be extremely, extremely inclusive. The second uh, dimension is underwriting. Um, underwriting models for informal sector customers um, uh, oh. you know, are very underdeveloped. <clears throat> Uh, in some sense, we need distinct underwriting models for customers whose cash flows are so volatile. Um, uh, for example, Kaleidofin has developed Kai Score, which is now being used for almost one billion dollars of underwriting. Um, and uh, uh, you know, Kai Score permits the development of tailored loans. For example, for farmers, uh, farmers have cash flows that. Uh, you know, are bunched up uh, to, let's say, two to three months a year during harvest season. They need a different type of loan uh, 
uh, different structure of loan, different amortization, uh, and not uh, you know any a traditional EMI type loan. So Kaisco really helps the development of these tailored products as well as their underwriting. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Krishan, if I could turn to you uh, for a question about what can John Keels do to protect its vast uh, customer base from food inflation and help boost recovery of Sri Lanka's economy? Uh, I think the food inflation has been driven mainly by the agricultural products, inflation in vegetables and fruits. And that on the ground here has been primarily because of the crop shortfall due to the lack of chemical fertilizer. And we have, you know, knowing as the moment heard about the ban on chemical fertilizer late last year, we've been looking to find ways to assist the farmers to uh, ensure the impact on uh, crop is minimal. So, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, we were able to secure uh, fertilizer. You know, the government did allow some small quantities of, of fertilizer, and uh, we were able to also secure some organic fertilizer. Uh, and there were old stocks of fertilizer that had been imported from, from the past. So we were able to get that to the farmers. We used our own um, resources to get, to get that to the farmers and uh, also to educate the farmers on the optimum use of fertilizer. The farmers had been overusing fertilizer because it was quite cheap. Uh, so the, uh, the educating them on good agricultural practices uh, and minimizing the use of fertilizer also helped. So by doing that, we were able to, uh, together with the rest of the private sector, uh, minimize the impact, although there was a crop shortfall of about 30%, minimize the impact. And I think while inflation continues to be high, that had a positive impact on keeping inflation inflation down. And the other thing we are doing is looking at sourcing from multiple sources, um, uh, new sources from all over the world, uh, so that we can get it at the cheapest possible price. Thanks very much. Um, uh, Heidi, I'd like to ask you another question, if you don't mind. Um, uh, from the audience and how, you know, the question is, how can we ensure that private sector's contribution to green recovery are consolidated to assess its impact as well as the gaps? Uh, can green finance, for example, uh, consider both impact and gaps? Well, I think it has to. I think it's really important because I, I think that we're still evolving very much in terms of how uh, uh, we're going to be able to achieve you know, the, the tremendous transition that's ahead of us uh, globally. So we have to be able to take a look at this and we're going to have to evolve as we as we move forward in this space. Uh, I don't think that there's any one particular uh, blueprint that anyone could point to to say this is how it's going to be done and everyone needs to execute against it. Um, and I think, again, we see this challenge, whether, you know, you look at various countries, you'll look at it from an industry or even from a client perspective, um, it will change. So I think we have to be flexible and open-minded enough to say that we will put metrics in place. We need to be able to evaluate um, how we're progressing against it. But we also have to be willing to take a look at when we think we need to adjust, uh, how we need to improve upon it so that we can take this forward um, and, and, and really achieve you know, the, the daunting task uh, that, that's ahead of us. Thanks very much. I think we have... Uh, Question, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, from the audience. Um, Ode, uh, if I can ask, uh, the question is, is will your f animal feed product address uh, the cost for those in underdeveloped countries? Um, so I think there is a maturation process and we're working on a very large scale um, production facilities so as to really lower the, the, the cost uh, of production. Um, now, we've also um, been approached and we're thinking also about um, developing very low-tech and uh, low-capex um, uh, technologies that can be applied uh, in, uh, uh, in a less, let's say, uh, intensive uh, environment. Today, our technology is focused on uh, recycling 
uh, waste streams that comes from large agro-industrial um, uh, plants. So, uh, so, so there, a scale and capex is very uh, high. Um, but we do also have uh, solutions for more small-scaled um, uh, rearing uh, systems that farmers uh, would be able to uh, to use uh, in, uh, in in more scale uh, small scale environments. Um, so that is something that is very applicable, um, and we do work on some projects uh, in uh, uh, in uh, 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 Asia and in Africa. Uh, even though this, I think it's not our short term focus. Uh, we need to make the large scale uh, versions work. Uh, so as really to prove the competitiveness and performance of these uh, technologies. Uh, but we do see also opportunities to spread out uh, this uh, new way of rearing uh, nutrients in smaller scale environments. Thanks for that. And I think we've had some really uh, interesting ideas which have come out of today's. And what I wanted to do is to thank everyone because we were coming to the end of our, our session. Um, some of the ideas which, you know, all speak towards about collaboration, innovation, uh, coming together to use technology, um, and then measuring that to be able to, you know, figure out how, you know, I do like that to measure accountability that comes with that. And I think that, you know, uh, all the bright minds uh, that you bring, as well as all the different people that you're working with can actually help, uh, you know, uh, uh, change uh, the course of things. And so I want to thank you all that you know, my six uh, brilliant uh, panelists, as well as the audience for engaging with us today. I think what's become clear is that the private sector obviously, you know, has a private, a very much a central role to play when it comes to economic recovery. When we hear about the, you know, the technology uh, adoption, the investments, uh, uh, and the innovation that's needed for a greener and more resilient Asia and the Pacific region. Um, ADB will continue to expand uh, our uh, private sector operations in scale and in reach to make uh, sure the forces of good are fully supported and multiplied. And that's what's being done in partnership with governments and civil society in the region. I think that some of the comments that we've heard today talk about partnerships, and I think that is the key going forward. So I really want to thank you for your engagement and uh, for your support. And we look forward to uh, building a more prosperous, inclusive, resilient and sustainable Asia and Pacific together. Uh, so I wanted to wish you uh, to say thank you very much. And I wanted to uh, suggest that you have a great day and very much enjoy the rest of the annual meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>